Dr. Bruce Sherrick, we've wanted you on for a while. I appreciate the time. Let me give your super long title. You are the director of the TIAA Center for Farmland Research at the University of Illinois. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Hey, we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff, but let's, since I'm talking to a college professor here, let's get a little philosophical. Why, why this? Like, why this topic? You could specialize in a bunch of stuff, right? So why this? So I think uh, I have a kind of the best accidental career of anybody that you've ever met. I grew up on a farm and went to a university where agriculture was still important. Um, got to go outside that field and do my academic degrees in a much more financial focused kind of setting. And then discovered that, you know, what connects us all is somehow the land that, that we're all going to eat. We're all going to live somewhere. We're all going to consume, all going to be part, you know, participants on the planet. And so that led me back. I had a, phenomenal, uh, lucky choice of my first place of employment and uh, took this uh, position that I hold as a temporary job and I still hold it 33 years later. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that you talk about is you follow trends in this space and you are looking particularly these days at the three eyes. What do you mean? Uh, that's it. I appreciate that tip because most people would think that the three eyes are Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa. That's kind of the epicenter of agriculture. Sure. And we usually think about whatever happens in that kind of middle of the country eventually uh, kind of washes out over the rest of the country, or it's kind of the, ame the amoeba that moves out across the country. But I think the new three eyes for agriculture are really inflation, income, and interest rates. We can think of some other, you know, things that impinge on it, whether that's international trade and, and where things are grown and where things are consumed are different. So we have to have some transportation and trade in there. Um, and we have kind of a, a set of income elements that are different than they used to be, but we'll, we'll fit those back in. But I think understanding those three major issues, especially in the context of today's macro environment, really are the critical parts. We're... Uh... This is not a, a reflection of me calling you old. I, I'm saying uh, experienced here, and I'm not enough years uh, younger than you to make fun of your age anyway. But you have done this for a while. And I'm curious, as you look at people's psyches, um, I think about I think of my kids on their devices and all of that, you know, and and everything is boom, 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 boom. Where it's 24 hour news cycle, cable, social media, all this stuff. And when you're looking in this space, particularly in the side of investing, have you seen people's psyches changed? I mean, this the best way to look at this is you get into this for the long haul, right? The appreciation right. of the land, that's where your assets are gonna grow. Uh, can people still think like that enough or, you know, Russia attacks Ukraine and what's that gonna mean? Input cost jump, or there's a drought here, there's a hurricane here, whatever. Those are all factors, but do you know, can, are people still wired to look at the long-term view of things? I think in agriculture, they generally are, but you've hit on something that's really pervasive. And I think this digesting of the instant news cycle has been harder for agriculture because you, you highlighted some things. The invasion of Ukraine, is that going to ruin our fertilizer markets? And are we going to have to supply the rest of the world with wheat and corn or uh, the tariffs a few years ago or the uh, pandemic and the shutdown and supply chain interruptions? Is that permanent inflation in food? And what does all that mean to the asset class? I think that's true. I think the interest in and the, um, the kind of uh, requests for instant analysis of what the feedback and what the long-term asset would be have really gone up. I get those calls all the day for all the time for things like, oh, the, the you know, I'll have at least five phone calls this week to talk about foreign investment in agriculture. And it's really a kind of a non-issue, but we have, you know, people introducing legislation and responding and, and, and all of that is not really what drives the asset class. So from the producer um, on the ground owner side, I think the the length of duration of, of interest in what affects it has not really changed that much, but the things you can do to affect your short-term income and your short-term participation in things like government programs or wind leases or solar leases or understanding next year's water rights if you're in the West, those have shortened dramatically, but the asset class is still long-term. I think the way I have learned to uh, be in front of a crowd, so to speak, is rather than say, this is the thing that I'm worried about, 
is to now start by saying my long-term perspective is that there will be more people on the planet. They're going to eat food. And I want to understand Hmm. what's going to influence the path from here to there. What's the, as we see these USDA forecasts that generically speaking, uh, income may be down double digits for 23 versus versus 22, which, you know, 22 is so, right. so strong for so many people. What's the impact of that as we transition into 24? Uh, from my perspective, very little. Uh, so I think, again, this illustrates kind of the soundbite uh, news cycle problem that is hard to really disentangle without a longer term perspective. If if you hadn't known what 2022's income was, would you call 2023 income high or low? And so I think the, the casting from the political perspective is always to take advantage of the, the version of a description, you know, which, which part of the elephant are you feeling when your blindfold is on kind of moment. And if we were to take the long-term trend of income and the long-term trend of what supports income and project it forward, we're really asking not about what happened to us this year, but what we expect to happen going forward. And if this year's impact was so dramatic that you know it would have influenced asset values, which it wasn't, we'd have something to talk about. But on the long-term trend, it's it's not a it's not a disaster to be blunt. Every year there are pockets, depending on, you know, it's the only industry where you plant stuff and then wait for weather. <laughs> the weather doesn't know who owns the land, doesn't care doesn't care where political boundaries are between states and so on. And so you you have this production system that has a lot of things you can't control as a producer. Crop insurance is better than it used to be. Government programs are more supportive than there used to be. But 2023 is income just as an outcome. So I could think of it like this. You're, you're about to roll six dice and play some version of Yahtzee. And um, this year, this first roll, you got a one on one of the dice and the next one you got a six and so on. And you could say, oh, gosh, look at this, this pattern that I just rolled. Isn't that terrible or isn't that great? And I'd say, well, if you're going to roll those dice another million times, I can tell you on average what you're going to get. And I'm much more concerned with that question. Where are we headed? What's influencing the, the dice that we're forced to roll? And we're swapping out, you know, this dice for that one. And we're, we're starting to say things like, this collection of things we're going to be exposed to is more influenced by international trade or strength of the dollar or the greening of the energy complex than it used to be. We didn't have sustainable aviation fuels five years ago. We didn't have ethanol in 2001. So the the factors we're doing are changing. But the question I would respond to your question with is, do you really care about this year's income if it's not really connected to future income or do you care about future income? If we start collecting these things, and I've listened to, to some of the some of the other talks you've given, when you talk about the pressure on producers to grow more stuff as our population continues to grow to expand, as well as ever so slowly the available farmland in our country shrinks little by little here, plus this realization that there are changing weather weather patterns and there are that influences what you can grow, how you can grow, all of those things. And then you have the political dynamics of this as well. When you put all of this stuff together and try to figure out where sustainability plays into this and green energy and producing more food, where is that going? Um, I'm, you know, the next 30 years of my career after the first 30 some, uh, this is what I'm going to study. So um, I think we're at the early stages of understanding that because we had, I don't know, five or six years ago, BlackRock saying sustainability mattered. And we we all kind of injected ESG to publicly traded companies mm-hmm. kind of behavior. And then we had kind of this, um, you know, the irrational exuberance about the possibility of carbon payments. And, and then, you know, you've seen that picture of the irrational exuberance, the trough of desperation, the the hill of realization and the stability at the end. Um, we have kind of gotten to the point where we have to make real decisions now. And I think understanding and reporting sustainability standards in general will become base table stakes. We can't just not do that anymore. But I think the farmer friendly, the, the ag centric version of those is emerging. If for full disclosure, I'm the board of on the board of, of leading harvest, and I think that's really turning out to be um, one of the best ways of thinking about it. You know, watch what you're doing, record what you're doing, understand its impact, and try to look for moments of improvement potential. 
But in general, I, I love to talk to uh, folks about this issue because you'll start with somebody saying things like, um, you know, we're, we're ruining the land and it's shrinking and we're going to run out of food. And my perspective is Malthus will always be wrong. We're producing maybe twice as much or more. Uh, Secretary Vilsack has a more precise way of saying this, but we're producing twice as much with half the inputs compared to 50 years ago. Right. Yields are ever increasing. The places we're putting uh, complicated genetics so that we can grow corn in parts of North Dakota where we couldn't before, for example, or um, understanding that we have nitrogen efficiency now that's mind boggling. So yes, nitrogen escapement is a huge problem, but the nitrogen per bushel of corn has continued to just inch down and inch down and inch down. And we are making improvements in sustainability efforts, broadly speaking, safety of pesticides. People have their view on particular inputs, but they're much safer than they used to be. We, we truly have lower toxicity in the plant environment, plant control, uh, weed control environment and, and insect control environment than we had ever before, the safest ever. So we're growing more. We're growing in slightly different places. We have more frost-free days further north. We're, we're, the thing that you just described, that we're planting houses and other things that take some agricultural land out of production every year, that's absolutely true. But we're more than keeping up with the world's production, and we're going to grow more in lots of new places, and the genetic improvements are nothing short of mind-boggling to me that we've done in the last 50 years to watch uh, uh, corn continue to grow more and more on every square inch. We have technologies for using water that are incredibly efficient compared to our historic mechanisms for irrigation. We have decided that the um, the genome that creates um, a particular kind of oil in the seed before it had to be extracted, maybe that's where we do the first level fermentation in the future, I don't know. But this this idea that we're being sophisticated about it is just why Malthus will always be wrong. I'm going to call this part one. I hope that uh, hope we can continue this this Absolutely. conversation in the future and do it often. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.